Cameron sits in the trunk of the jeep, legs hanging out over the edge, dangling toward the ground that's further away than the usual than usual due to the tilt. Oh my uh, god, that scared me. The music yeah. came in so loud. It's, it's, such, it's just a sound out of nowhere. <laughs> Meanwhile, he fiddles with his old acoustic guitar that's been stashed in the jeep for over, at least a year, tuning it slowly. He hadn't even remembered it was there until they'd folded down the seats for a place to try and sleep. He'd last played it at Devin's parents' house because they wanted to hear him perform, and he just left it there in the jeep afterwards. He hadn't had a reason to play it since. The rest of the night, or early morning, really had, hadn't been terrible. Dev was easily comfortable, and the hard surface not all that different from his side of the mattress, which was rock hard compared to Cameron's much squishier foam. He had tossed and turned until Dev finally pulled him in to lay his head on the bear's stomach, the soft, warm surface enough to lull Cameron into a dozing state of consciousness while Dev snored loudly. He'd gotten used to snoring after all these years, and now found it comforting rather than annoying. It was a good night, considering the circumstances. Dev had been unsure about sleeping in the tilted jeep at all because it gave him a bad feeling. He also had a bad feeling about Cameron going back to the motel with him, so he left him here along with the bear uh, gathered up. He left him here alone while the bear gathered up all the rest of their stuff. Five hours had passed since Artie texted Devin, so the bear had been getting angsty about that as well. They'd had a bit of an argument, and Cameron only agreed to stay behind when Dev promised not to go back to that forest to text Artie again. Now Cameron sits here, moping, and feeling the feeling of a lopsided relationship returning. I suck at guitar. He mumbles to himself quietly, out of habit, knowing people didn't like hearing it since he was good enough, which had been his goal. All of his singer-songwriter idols played guitar, and he'd wanted to be just like them. He'd forced himself to learn how to become good enough, with all the awkward fingerings, the constant tuning, and the pain of holding down steel strings with finger pads, even after he built up calluses. That was the hardest sell for me. I, it's so physically uncomfortable to use a guitar that it really curbed my interest. Yeah, that's why I play bass. Bigger strings hurts less. That's how he'd describe guitar in general. A pain. He preferred piano, and that's what he used to that's what he used to write all of his music. But the devastatingly sad men of the 90s Northwest indie music scene didn't play piano. They played guitar, because they were also rugged and tough, molded by the logging towns they originated from. It turns out that one's image is just as important in indie as it is in pop, despite the former trying to convince itself it isn't. So, Cameron had tried to conform to that, and in the end, it hadn't mattered. The hours and hours dedicated to learning the instrument through high school and college now felt wasted. Still, the feeling of the instrument is familiar in his paws, even if his fingers are already getting sore. He tries to think of one of the less embarrassing songs, one of the ones where he wasn't just wearing the influence of cloudy, dreary, northwestern cities on his sleeve even though that's where he's from. He'd tried and failed to duplicate their poetic and opaque lyricism. Instead, he found himself slipping back again and again to the style of his own generation. While his idols of the 90s wove lyrics that forced the listener to delve into something complex, to find meaning in the metaphors and symbolism, singer-songwriters born in, in the 90s, like himself, presented their lyrics in a more literal, honest way that often described specific situations with seemingly nothing hidden. Folk punk. To Cameron, it's two sides of the same coin. Instead of discovering meaning and complexity, it's about discovering complexity and simplicity. He sighs, deciding it's tuned well enough. He glances up, making sure Dev isn't heading back before playing. 
He's badly out of practice, but he s slowly starts to warm up. Cameron sings quietly, almost under his breath. What did I sign you up for? <laughs> I there's a very, <laughs> very small uh, possibility that I will sing this, and that that small possibility is about zero percent. <laughs> <laughs> This particular song got the attention of an independent label on the West Coast after one of their scouts heard it on the college radio station. They signed him in, in his junior year of college. Looking back, it was the high point of his life. Dev celebrated in earnest, happily telling him that he'd make more money than himself ever would. But what Cameron didn't realize was that even after being signed, he could still be dropped without, realize, without release, releasing any of his music, and after what was probably the lowest point in his life, they did just that. Dropped over text message with his agent saying the demos he'd made in studio weren't up to their quality standard. That hurt. A lot. Because he knew it was true. He'd been nervous the entire time, and his output wasn't even close to what he was capable of. Though he tried to comfort, comfort himself with the idea that most musicians go it alone these days. His own postings on the internet barely got more than a few dozen listens. Then he finally realized that he was in it for the wrong reason. His peers just liked playing music, throwing stuff out into the ether, whether anyone heard it or not. Cameron needed an audience to stay motivated, to be famous, so in a way, I fucking deserved it. There we go. Yep. The thesis of Cameron's whole character <laughs> is his self-loathing. Uh, at least Devin never brought it up. Cameron stops playing, having seen brownish fur out the corner of his eye. He thinks it's Dev and immediately feels his face flush, freezing and just sitting there. This is why he didn't uh, play or sing in a serious way these days. Now it just feels like showing off a skill that he was never really skilled at in the first place. But after a while, he doesn't hear anything. No voice. No footsteps. And biting through his embarrassment, Cam looks up the road where he'd been certain that his boyfriend had been watching him. Dev? The silence is heavy and thick. It's really concerning because I don't like how much Brian looks like Dev. Yeah. <laughs> and we don't know who Artie is at all. Yeah, I have no idea what Artie looks like. A weird feeling. And everything went real quiet. Cameron stares up the empty road, the feeling of unease growing until he finally shoves his guitar to the side and pulls out his phone, tapping on a mindless gaming app to distract himself. Nope. Nope. Nope, nope. Not doing it again. Not right now. And even though the road remains empty, and even though the sun shines brightly above, illuminating everything around him, the feeling of what is becoming a very familiar dread continues to grow. Hmm? Then that light shining down on everything changes shifting to a more golden glow. What the hell is going on? Cameron had a few bad trips in the past, shrooms being the worst, and that was what gave him his first panic attack. In a strange way, this feels very similar. Please not now. I have control, and I'm saying not now. No control. Shit! That voice. Well, that feeling. It instantly made up. It made all of the fur on the back of his neck stand up. Cameron starts walking up the road, toward Echo, just under a mile away. Dev, come back now, please. The panic creeps up his neck like he's... Drowning. 
until last night he hadn't had a panic attack in over two years. Now it's like his brain has relearned the spiraling process of gasping for air that's readily available, but still feels out of reach. He fights the urge, counting, trying to remember the pace of Dev's steady breaths. Hadn't he wanted to reject the idea that he needed Dev to face his fears? Doesn't he know how to handle this? How to do this safely? Cameron also knows that running to Dev will only make things worse for his boyfriend. Did he want to stress him out even more? The coyote stops, then turns around slowly. Just like that, the feelings of panic and terror slowly fade away to be replaced by a feeling of purpose. Something solid. Something resolute in its existence. Something that's already happened. Nothing can be done to change it. A feeling of acceptance. So cool that they have both forward and backward, left and right sprites. Oh, it's it's such a good touch. It allows oh. them to do so much more with like this the scene creation. I love this so much. Potentially, but I I, I think this is a uh, CG. Is it? I I that looks I, like it's just a center framed uh, sprite. It could be. I wonder. Cameron's walk slows to a more measured pace, mirroring someone just outside of his view. In another place? No. In the same exact place, just another time. Cameron knows what's happening, and he questions what he's about to do. But with his this new feeling of calm assuredness, the coyote decides to let it happen. Dev didn't want him doing this because he's had a change of heart. But so is Cameron, and this is his choice to make. So he lets it happen. And he senses this person. A girl. A feline, walking just like him, years and years ago. He tries to keep her sobs quiet, walking along the road by the lake. She's been looking forward to this for months. He saved up money from babysitting jobs to buy her own dress, her own fake jewelry, and her, make and her makeup. Her father had found the makeup a week ago and threw it away, telling her only bad things happened to girls who, wear, who wore makeup. Even then, she'd still had the dance to look forward to. But now James, her ex from last year, had ruined it. He'd shown up drunk, proposed to her, then cussed out her new boyfriend, whom she'd only been seeing for a month now, until he left. At least now she's glad she doesn't have makeup on, with how wet her eyes are. This has been the last dance of the year at Echo High, and she's worried she's going to graduate with no boyfriend at all, and no money to go anywhere. Lost in her thoughts, she notices fast, pounding footsteps only seconds before it happens. Before it happens. She sees James as it happens. She realizes what's happening in that same moment. Knowing him, this is actually something she expected. And in that moment, she decides that maybe this is for the best. Cameron? Lost in the vision, Cameron feels himself recoil from something touching him. Cameron loses his balance, windmilling his arms comically, and he has a split second to recognize Dev. The bear has his paw out, like he'd been like he'd been resting it on the coyote's arm. The look of shock is mirrored on his boyfriend's face, before he goes over the edge and straight into the lake. Cameron! So yeah, I guess those were CGs, but yeah. it's so cool that the game is able to play like that. It, it transitions between them so well. It's oh, like it's, a, it's it's a really huge neat. step up from being limited by just having a background and, and sprites to work with. I love the, it's like a shift in design at Echo Project yeah. seemingly. Cause like I saw, 
like when I was working on the essay, I, I got a preview of some of the CGs from like Kemia and Antaria and stuff. So like, there's like a scene where Amicus and Neferu are in that one, uh, like the room that Neferu was staying in in Astra. But it's yeah. like a perspective CG where the two of them are in these positions and like their expressions are changing and it's like a it's like a scene progressing over the course of it and like there's like a there's been a few instances like that like the hot spring and so on like there's moments where they they take one moment and they modify it over and over again to create a preceding scene and we've had that like multiple times now like with the car and so on or like they're kind of like the fact that when there's when the two of them are leaning against the jeep they just have like a variety of poses and stuff and so it really like makes some of these scenes hit yeah well it, al it allows them to do more accompaniment and more visual storytelling than just relying on background and cg or in sprite work you know which is just very static and uh even doing things like i guess i mean i guess we can talk about it because you've you've done jenna's route now like having the animated embrace in jenna's route when he walks on screen that isn't like an animated sprite yeah, that is, it's like a hundred images. Yeah, it's like a hundred and eighty sprites that all load one after another very quickly to give. I mean, this is how animation works, obviously. But uh, my but point video is, video game not animation like does not GIF. normally work like flipbook animation. <laughs> yes, exactly. So it, it's interesting then to see them kind of force RenP the engine or RenPy to to do what they want it to do and now they're kind of doing a, a different approach to that in like okay if we can't get the cinematics the way we want to we need to shift towards having a lot of specific cgs and use cgs to our advantage rather than just trying to get things to animate on sprites that's so cool it's so cool this game is is great so far <laughs> yeah and I'm always, of course, trying to register, like, okay, is this a character we know from anything every time anything happens? But, like, Echo High, we know no one from Echo High. Yeah, none. Absolutely not. And that, okay. that seems like it, I mean, just trying to remember the names, the only James I can think of was in, like, the 1800s, right? That's one of Carl's ancestors, I think, or one of Jenna's ancestors or something James like that. James Hendrix is a character, James right? James Hendrix. Yeah, I think so. So, like, this definitely wasn't that person. Th these were cats. Yeah, so I was like... TJ's parents, but I'm like one. This this girl wasn't old enough to have had kids yet, and TJ's from Canada. Yeah. Uh, and like Heather, same yeah, problem. Yeah, wasn't Heather. Yeah, it's like it's, she's too old to be Heather because and she's Heather because there was no Echo High School for the generation we saw in Echo. Yeah, they went to Peyton, didn't they? Yeah, because so you visit Echo and TJ's route, or you 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 visit Echo High School and TJ's route, and that just fully cements that like. It is extremely gone. Like, yeah, it's not, very abandoned. It's not been used for a while. The coyote expects to go under, and stay under, just like the girl from Echo High School. But a jolt goes through his body as his rear lands on a rocky surface, just a foot underwater, and Cameron cries out loudly. Fuck. Devin looks up to see. Uh, Cameron looks up to see Dev getting ready to jump in. I'm fine. At first, Cameron's just embarrassed. Like, he got caught doing something he shouldn't. Which he knows is the case in Dev's mind. It's not as deep as it used to be. What? As he <laughs> climbs out with Dev's help, though, that embarrassment changes to anger. That's clever. That's clever little characterization of, of Cameron knowing that it used to be deeper because he is psychically sensing and has the yeah. memories of people from the past. Because that's not information he should know at all. Yeah, he's reacting to them. He's reacting to the memory, but not. He's like he's relaying the information so naturally that he doesn't even register that it's not information anyone should have, including him. Yeah, that's good. The coyote grunts and snarls quietly as he automatically starts stripping off his clothes, his plaid shirt and jeans sticking to his soggy fur. Dev hovers over him, trying to help, but mostly just getting in the way. Dev, you have a list of people who died here, right? What? What are you talking about? You just fell into the lake. Stop talking about this shitty town and let me make sure you're... 
Oh, that's real rich coming from you. I've been saying that to you for the past five years, and yet here we are. So no, I won't stop. Give me the list, or I'll just look it up myself. Dev glares, making himself look big, but Cameron doesn't budge, even though in that moment, he realizes his phone got wet, and he can only hope that it's still going to work after this. Well, after a second, Cameron has an iPhone, doesn't he? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so that's like IP67 waterproof. It's fine. He's gonna <laughs> Doesn't mean it's take new. Take that. Damn, you don't know, you don't geez, know if it's a who's new the phone elitist now? <laughs> that's true. I mean, like, horror protagonists are required by law to have the oldest possible phone that, th that could still work. <laughs> <laughs> he pulls it. He's been playing Snake on his phone this whole time. That's the gaming app he was playing on his little Nokia. <laughs> <laughs> it's like an, he's just running an emulator of like the Windows 95 pinball machine. Yeah, it wasn't it, when when uh, Dev was being a phone elitist earlier. It wasn't be, it wasn't Android versus iPhone. It was Android versus a feature phone from 1998. Yeah, it's a it's a fucking uh, it's an iPod Touch that's been like jailbroken <laughs> to have cell service. <laughs> he has a he has a Motorola Razor. <laughs> It's actually it's just a, it's just a fucking like, a fucking shuffle that works as a pager. Remember <laughs> shuffles? Like, hey, would you like to yeah. lose this? <laughs> would you like a device you can lose extremely easily? The reason why I never had one is because I would I would have sent it through the wash a hundred times. Yeah. Didn't you just send something through the wash twice or something? Uh, yeah, I sent my I sent my $160 vape through the wash and destroyed it and then sent another one through the wash right after I bought a replacement. Oh. The, the replacement was not as expensive. Uh, the replacement was just a crappy battery. But uh, yeah, yeah I, I've lost my put my vape in my pocket privileges because of that. I've done pretty good. I have not. I, I send receipts through the wash more often than I want to, but I have like a really specific ritual to how my pockets work. So I very specifically, my phone and my wallet and my keys are always in a specific pocket or a specific spot on, on one desk at all times forever. And I've, that's been a good ritual so far. <laughs> the receipts have been less lucky. I just get a weird wadded up nightmare ball sometimes just somewhere in my laundry. If I'm lucky enough yeah, to put the stay in one chapstick. piece and not like disintegrate everywhere. Yeah, the amount of chapstick I've sent through the wash and then through the dryer and then I like put on a pair of pants and put my hand in the pocket and it's just coated in wax is <laughs> remarkably high. Like that that's a truly deeply unpleasant feeling is putting your hand into what is a moist waxy pocket. <laughs> I don't like this. I don't like, I don't want that yeah. surprise at all. Oh, you you don't you don't want to put your hand into the moist flesh pocket? No. The, the the nice waxy smeared goopy flesh pocket. No. No. Ooh woo. Uh, put put your hand in the chapstick pocket, Keith. Yeah. Ooh woo. Calm down before you give someone a new fetish in the audience. Oh no. Oh no. I'm <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry, viewers. <laughs> I didn't mean to awaken something in you. Yeah. It's like the fucking like those like balls that you put over people's fists so they don't have fingers anymore and they're like locked, but it's just like you just like tie your belt Ooh. around someone's like waist to trap their hands in their in the chapstick pockets. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, thank you. After a few seconds, the bear deflates. Speaking of kinks, <laughs> please, I, I just want to be out of here. I'll do whatever you want afterwards. <laughs> Ooh, -woo. let's just get home first. <laughs> That cools Cameron's outrage for the time being. Never having seen Dev look so defeated. We will go home, and I'm sorry I'm being like this, but you have to understand that this is changing everything for me. And I, I just need this for a little bit, okay? It genuinely feels like Dev didn't consider how it would go if Cameron, if he actually got his way. And yeah, Dev 100%. genuinely, which, which is a constant reoccurring thing that I keep pointing out in like Howley stories, but like there's, it's like the ideas of either the audience or the characters getting what they want being the bad thing. Yeah, it's like very much like a monkey's paw type situation. Yeah. 
like himbo wolf kidnaps you out of human society into a furry fantasy land and here's why it's terrifying and <laughs> or like here's the character you clearly want to be with an echo and here's the 500 reasons why his character traits are terrifying to deal with and so on and here it's like cameron does get the new purpose in life and recontextualization of his mental illness that devon was trying to get and it's making him obsessive and and make him like want to take risks and make him not want to leave when all the signs point towards that yeah and I, I think one of the things here too that's kind of crazy is Cameron and Devin have now switched places narratively and it's scary because I mean again we kind of talked about this but like Cameron is completely unanchored now he is deep into the ramifications of this and he told Devin at the start I need you to pull me back but now yeah. when the time has finally arrived for Devin to kind of nut up and pull him back Cameron's like no man let me have this just one more hit please you know it's yeah. that kind of like addiction metaphor I, I, I mentioned that I think that they're kind of setting up here is like that taste of meaning is so powerful that it becomes I mean like it's basically a narcotic to you now. Know? yeah and there's yeah there's this it, aspect where he told him to pull him back but now that involves just like with an just like with addiction this it becomes this element where like the person that you said to do that is now telling you not to and demanding yep. that you be, treat them a certain way and so and they're the, making the you act, out to be the villain yeah so the act of trying to help them even according to their own previous wishes feels abusive yep and and the way and like devon already has this element where he's seeing cameron flinching him and not knowing why and he feels like the bad guy on some level and doesn't like there's a question of whether or not the person involved has the strength or even like the nuanced like interpretation to even know what to do in these situations where the best thing to do is not follow your wishes yep De Devin basically needs to pick up Cameron and just walk away <laughs> yeah <laughs> just carry clearly. him off the, the, I mean, and even even more than that, like, I think it's interesting because they set up that Devin feels bad about what he did. And like, I, I think one of the benefits of Howley's like writing and nuance is that he has a very good ability to like write flawed characters that do wrong and are wrong. Who then have to deal with that. And the story isn't about like, see, they're wrong, punish them. It's like, yeah, they did a bad thing. And now they have to live with having done a bad thing. And like the ramifications of that are more, uh, uh, the story is more about that than their like inherent character moral judgment about having done that bad thing. Right. And so you have Devin here who's like, I'm going to take my cool superpowers boyfriend to the, to the Silent Hill and we're going to, we're going to solve the mystery of Silent Hill. And then he's like, oh, <laughs> Actually, this was a bad idea, and I was wrong, and I feel bad about that. I feel like a lot of other stories would be like, that would be like the end of his character arc, is him realizing like, oh, shit, that was a mistake. I'm sorry. We have now rectified the problem, and and I'm a better person, and I won't make the same mistake again. This story is about Devin very quickly realizing that he did the wrong thing, and now his actual character arc is him dealing with the ramifications and consequences of that thing while trying to also understand and get past what led him to do that, which is interesting. That is a far more intriguing uh, setup for a character than the sort of one note hero's journey would have been had it taken the whole game for him to realize that maybe taking his psychic boyfriend to Silent Hill was a bad idea. It it does almost go into this like this like Chase and Leo territory of like what if one of them opened the game by just overtly realizing what all their mistakes were and not knowing how to fix it as opposed yep. to the reality of their dynamic where they're just both a mess and actively trying not to do and neither of them actually really want to address their the fault situation. because they both want they're, like they're both they're that it's on it's a, it's its own toxic nuanced relationship i'm just like i'm kind of obsessed with the fact that like how he managed to, draw, to write stories with such nuanced specific characters in this way where we're like we can sit here and talk about it forever and he's also finished three visual novels yeah 
<laughs> I mean, finished in air so quotes with Echo. So people just have the gene, man. They could just do it. It's finished, finished in air quotes with Echo because he got handed off. But still, like, like nobody finishes these. <laughs> nobody finishes yeah. making these ever. I think I've heard that tragically this is like the least popular Echo Project visual novel or something, which is sad. But holy shit, Arches. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess I guess it makes sense though. But it also, I mean, for a really long time, I didn't even realize Arches was even a thing like i knew about interia and and chemia and uh and the smoke room but i didn't even realize arches was coming out because it was like under the fold on itch.io like i had to scroll down to find it yeah so it's kind of it's kind of interesting i'm sure now that it's out it, it definitely doesn't have the critical mass of husbando fan art that smoke room has every <laughs> single day yeah Okay, but I'm not leaving your side until we're out of this town, okay? Didn't I tell you this was a bad idea at the very start? Motherfucker, Cameron is such a shithead. What are you talking about, dude? Devin, come here. I, I, let me date Devin. <laughs> Fuck this guy. It's, it's a lot that he would say oh that when he's God. the one actively pushing to make things worse for the last oh. several hours. I mean, like, I give Chase Hunter a lot of flack, but I give <laughs> Leo a lot of flack. And I give Jenna a lot of flack, uh, and Flynn especially, for just, like, chronically saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. <laughs> but Cameron is batting a perfect average here for literally saying the thing he should not say at every opportunity. It's, I just want to go lot. up to this dude and be like, uh, read, like, how to make friends and influence people like just like learn learn social interactions don't be a, such a shithead why are you so mean to people be nice be interested in people oh it's just an element of like just devin immediately was like stove hot don't touch stove and, <laughs> and he's still being why'd you touch the stove devin didn't i tell you not <laughs> to touch the stove you don't you want to touch idiot? the stove again i think i'm really into the you, stove these days <laughs> you big dingus like, no just, don't don't turn off the burner i'm cooking with that it's like fuck you dude jeez ne next cg is fucking devin where the angel on his shoulder and the devil on his shoulder are both cameron <laughs> <laughs> oh my god oh that's so brutal and the thing is, you know, we're ma we're sitting here making fun of Cameron here, but like Cameron's a very believable character. He is shitty in the way that people are shitty. No. Like this is not an an over no. the top depiction of a person who is unfair and uh even in some ways like kind of abusive to the people that care about him, but it's just that is rough. That is no. a rough thing to say to someone. Like I'm, I just think about like me and Stephanie having a visceral reaction to Flynn because we know Flynn in real life. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're like one hundred percent. No, no. <laughs> I don't want to be in this scene anymore. Yeah, and I mean, I want to put it out there. I like Cameron as a character. I think he's great so far. But like, yeah. this but also guy maybe needs throw him back in therapy. The lake. Yeah, exactly. Like, just put it, push him on his ass, dude. You get, just put him <laughs> into the water. He's fine. Cameron tries to lighten the mood a bit, not liking the conflicts they're having on this little trip. They hardly had any before coming here. Now they have such different ideas of what they should be doing, it's like they're in a tug of war. Dev takes out his phone bringing up the document he'd been using to map out the supernatural happenings and history of Echo. So, um... It was a girl. Teenager. A bobcat from, like, the 50s, I think? Uh... A student from Echo High School. Get the big puffy dress. Shoulders. Very grease, yeah. Yeah. Dev raises his brows, scrolling slowly on his phone, and then looks back up. Yeah, June 1954, an 18-year-old bobcat drowns in the, in the lake in what is thought to be a suicide. So the fucker got away with it? Who? How does your tail feel, by the way? 
Dev is running his paw along his tail, feeling out the vertebrae. Cameron finds the bear's disinterest in all this more and more irritating, especially now that he's found what feels like his purpose. <clears throat> he, he can help somehow. Dev hits a bruised spot on his tail, and the coyote winces before shoving his paw away. Ow! Not now, Dev! Listen! Her ex-boyfriend killed her. I saw him run up and push her into the lake. Did you have to experience that? Do you feel okay? Dev, I'm not important here. This is about someone who got murdered and some piece of shit got away with it. I got bad news about people dying in Echo and then the people that did it not facing consequences for decades. Yeah, I mean, in general, in <laughs> Just, general, most murders go unsolved, bud. Yeah, but especially, like, astronomically <laughs> so in Echo. I don't think exactly. a murder has ever been solved in Echo. <laughs> no. The only, pr the, only uh, the only confirmed example we have of someone being punished for a mur murder was the wrong person. Yeah, literally, the incorrect person got, yes. got the punitive justice for that. You know, all you literally are here... The murder is probably dead by now, but it's past the statute of limitations anyway, probably. I, I know it's infant for murder, isn't it? But yeah, you it's will never for murder. But you will never catch this uh one hundred year old man either way. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just I'm waiting for Cameron to be like, and we're not asking the right questions about the moon landing, and yeah, Ted Cruz just... is the Zodiac killer. <laughs> like he's that he's <laughs> like on him. that level of like chasing a thread here because it gives his yeah. life meaning. But it's like not the questions he should be asking. It's not the stuff a person should fixate on, especially with these issues. First of all, don't call yourself unimportant. You're still alive and you need, and you need to keep it that way by not falling into lakes because of these awful visions. I need to tell her family or at least someone so people know the truth. Devin frowns deeply at the coyote. Me too, Dev. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, babe, I know you can see things that I can't and all, but I gotta be honest and say that no one's gonna care. Oh, They're dead. Hell yeah, Devin. The girl, hell and more yeah. than likely her ex, too. That's short-sighted as all hell, Dev. He could definitely still be alive, having lived a full life after murdering someone. Cameron, 1950 was 70 years ago. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> they, what, they were like 18 so at the time? That did. guy is late unless 80s. Unless your next power is time travel, like, you're not fixing his life of serial killing. <laughs> Devin literally just said the most reasonable thing he has said this entire time, which is like, hey, bud, I appreciate what you're going through, but like, let's move on. This is literally something we have no control over. And Cameron is like, no, fuck you. You're wrong. I have control <laughs> over it. Ooh, that's rough. And she might have siblings who are still alive or. I. I... I don't know. I think someone probably gives enough of a shit to want to know. And then... What? You go to them and tell them you're psychic, and then you had a vision of their loved one being murdered? Besides, I wouldn't be surprised if everyone knew what happened. A lot of times they do. There just isn't always enough evidence. Cameron feels his face get hot, glaring at the asphalt. I, every, he did make a scene in front of everyone before he killed her about her in front of yep. like at the dance So there's a lot of, there was a lot of evidence against him actually or at least as far as as far as like like public perception would go Yeah You wanted me to do this and you wanted answers. Why are you holding me now? Because I'm terrified right now of this town of the ghosts of you getting hurt somehow, because with the rate things are going, that's what's probably going to happen. I want to know where Lupita is. But she died because I made stupid mistakes. I can't have the same thing happen with you. Cameron's face gets hot again as he realizes Dev is about to cry. And his resolve wavers. He starts to step forward 
to hold Dev like the bear had held the coyote so many times. But then... The two of them look up to see a rather small sedan pulling up the road, a figure inside waving enthusiastically through the windshield. What the hell? Where's his truck? Womp womp. But you get a flat? It's Oh guy. no, he's hot! <laughs> oh no! <laughs> How will you further enable the toxic cycles of these characters? Oh, sprite no. man who has a sprite? <laughs> uh, uh. Here comes a new challenger! 